Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Tanvi. Like uh, Laura suggested, I'm the product manager on Developer Portal. Megan's the product owner, um, looking after the portal day to day. And Justin's our amazing tech lead uh, on, on this channel. We'll first start talking about what is New Day. So New Day is essentially a uh, subprime lending credit provider. We help people move forward with credit. That's one of our big purposes. Uh, we're in the both B2B and B2C space. So uh, in terms of B2B, we have multiple brands, um, you know, where we integrate with uh, partners like JLP. So you might have seen if you've uh, brought, bought credit off of John Lewis recently, um, we are the underwriters of that credit. And in terms of B2C space, we've got brands like Aqua, Marbles, Opus, um, you know, if you go on ClearScore or any of these websites directly, um, you can avail credit through that. Uh, just to give you a size of how big the business is, uh, we have close to 5 million customers. We are one of the five UK credit card issuers. Um, and we ha we've currently helped, um, you know, close to 2 million customers improving their credit scores in the last one year itself. Um, and then further down, we are now entering our third big space, which is providing a credit platform. Um, so few... Buzzwords, we're, we're entering, we're looking at a full cloud-based tech stack. We are also building a digital platform, API-first platform, and that's where the developer portal comes um, into place, where partners are able to come in uh, with their needs of how they want to provide a credit platform on their channels, uh, on their channels and New Day helps pr provision that. Um, we'll switch screens to a slideshow now. Um, so two years back, when I first started here at New Day, the, uh, we suffered from a couple of problems. Okay, so um, in terms of the problems that we as a business faced um, about two to three years back was we had poor visibility of our platform. Uh, our customers, and when, when I say customers, our partners were struggling to trust in our platform. There was a very high uh, onboarding and supporting cost included. So we had people sitting on calls and explaining our API documentation to clients. The onboarding process was very slow as well, uh, which basically for the business, it meant it was slow time to market, you know, struggling to support. And the experience for the end consumer wasn't that great. Um, a lot of, uh, you know, and when we talk about end consumer, they were obviously not able to... Um, buy credit on the channel of their choice. So there was a lot of friction for the end consumer to avail credit. Um, from, from an API experience perspective, API docs were, were a pain point to share for us. And uh, you know we had to take in a lot of effort internally within the organization to uh, break our internal API space, build up new governance processes, and at the same time, build a new developer portal, which was in line with our, uh, you know, platform strategy. So I'm going to hand over to Megan from there, she, who's who's going to explain you the platform strategy and then what we did with the new portal. Perfect. Thank you. Is that okay for everyone to hear? Can everyone hear me? Um, I don't know, Justin. Can you hear me? Can Still I... a bit low. Um, what about if I just come on time, please? There you go. Yes, yeah, better. I'm sorry. Um, perfect. So as we were um, looking at the problems we already had and that as we were looking at like what problems we had that Tammy just mentioned, we were also developing our platform strategy. We realized that we could with our technology we could do much more than just serve it internally and we wanted to offer this externally as a credit as a, a credit platform as a service. And um, the reason we wanted we wanted to do that I'm oh, sorry um, so once we actually thought, okay, now we can actually offer our um, platform externally, how will users actually see what our APIs we have? How will they see our offering? And even internally, how can everyone see the, the APIs that we want to share between us? So that's when we came, we realized that we need to create a developer portal. We decided to create our own developer portal, which I will share now. Um, here we go. So we decided to create our own developer portal. Oh. Um, sorry, one minute. There we go. Um, yeah, our own oh, portal. Start showing on the screen. No, oh. I'll stop.
Um, no, you're muted. There you go. Um, we've done this from like creating our own design system, so built of multiple components, and we've also used docs as code for our content. The other interesting thing that we've um, managed to benefit from creating our own portal is we're decoupled from a back end. So this means as we mature as a platform and a developer portal, we can actually choose the API management service that best suits our needs. Um, so it allows us that flexibility in terms of the alignment with the business. One of the other um, things that we've been continuously thinking about with the portal when we built it was the information architecture. As Tammy mentioned, we had our credit um, we had our credit business, and then now we're delving into more of the tech industry. So we wanted to make sure our users had the journey that was most suited to them. So here we can see we've separated our user journey based on new pay for retailers, which is more of our tech business and our um, platforms of strategy, open banking, which is a regulatory requirement given that we're a credit business, and also for aggregators, which is where the likes of your clear school will act will use this. Um, so that's how we separated it. And the other bit that um, we've also looked into is how can we actually help the technical versus non-technical users on the portal? So even though typically you could think of developer portal, it has developers in, product owners also need to know what their, like what capabilities we offer and business users, like how can the APIs actually help them? So we've done this in a few different ways, which I'll share now. So the first one is just through content. So an example is here. Um, I've worked with the team here to de develop the content. And also for me, I'm not the most technical. So try to really get the team to help um, with the content to explain how can I understand it better. And this will also help the audience who don't even work with a new day understand it. So Penny Drop, for example, very quite a high level about what it does without getting into much detail of the technicalities and also the process. But then if um, a product owner wants to learn a bit more about the APIs without going to the API spec, they can see what a successful um, journey would look like in the API at a high level. And it gives them that bit of context without needing to go into the API spec, understand what the API spec does. Um, and also what they what parameters they can customize to give them that bit of context um, that they may want without needing to go through the API spec and work it all out. The other thing that we've been focusing on is demos. So APIs are quite technical and it doesn't always bring the, pos the possibility of what the API can do to life. So sometimes you can't visualize how it will help you. Um, so we've tried to do that for our business users and we want to really help them understand like where the API comes into the customer journeys and everyone's journey differs as well. So here we've created a demo to see what like how where the APIs come in. So if I click through it, if we were about to buy some trainers, um, typically they'd ha be expected to like maybe have a, a banner here and if we go through to the basket and check out. We can add our payment method and as this progresses, we'll start to see where the APIs come in. So here's where we can have our widget and then by checking the eligibility, we actually have a piece here where you can go to the applications API and if we don't show this next time, we can actually learn a bit more about the API itself and also picture just where it comes in. So especially for me learning more about the APIs as we get more content on the portal, it really brings it to life for our users. So once we've gone, now we've looked at that, the other challenge we've, one of the challenges we've faced with this, we've thought of like our different users and the, um, and how we can create the information architecture. But I think once we actually got onto the content itself, we began to face a few problems for multiple reasons. So the first one was content is quite a new thing at New Day. It's not something we've always been put at the forefront, so especially like API content. So initially, when we in, when we brought in the process of upload your spec to our GitHub repo, and then we'll publish it for you, that's a brand new process and also quite a mundane process. It's not, no one really wants to like download something to upload it somewhere else, and it's easy to forget about. So we risked having our APIs not up to date. 
And also there wasn't, we weren't putting the effort into the API specs themselves. So we wouldn't have the right field descriptions or we wouldn't have them at all. We wouldn't have a description of what the endpoint did. And we started to see these little things which actually provided gaps in the content. And the other problem we faced was within our product content, as we weren't really focusing on content, we also weren't really viewing our APIs as a product as something that we could, should be able to sell externally and how to, how to do that for our potential consumers and how to explain the API in non-technical terms. And I think what also made that more challenging was Docs's codes. Um, that almost segregated it those who weren't technical and they weren't interested in going through like our MDX files. So we weren't really giving them the right, the fair chance to put their content on the portal. So after we realized this problem, we took it to the team, so Justin and the team, and said, you know, our portal will only be as good as its content. What can we do to mitigate these problems and support our developers and product owners in improving their content and just making it easier for them? Um, so Justin, I'll pass on to you. Sounds good. Thanks, Megan. Yeah. So yeah, I'm here to talk a little bit about our docs as code. Um, we've heard Megan talk about that and what exactly does that mean? Let me go ahead and share my screen so you all can follow along. Um, so docs code, right? Like we've heard about it. What does that really mean for us? Um, you know, one of our core missions here at, at New Day is really to empower the teams to um, be as self-sufficient as possible um, in creating and maintaining their content on that portal. So we wanted to equip them. We need to equip them with the tools necessary to uh, to do so. So uh, reduce friction um, and keep things streamlined as possible for, for technical and also for non-technical or maybe less technical uh, team members. So when we think about those options, we have like a full-blown CMS at one end of the spectrum, which um, can offer lots of, lots of features, um, but can also be kind of expensive and, and a little bit um, cumbersome to implement. So we wanted to kind of find some middle ground where we could give folks the tools that they um, that they could use um, with also a pretty light touch in terms of how we want to actually uh, integrate it. So um, we land on Docs as code. So uh, what does it look like? This is this is an example of uh, some of our documentation um, right here. So this is um, some of our external code. Um, actually, it's, it's code and our editorial content um, just in different file, uh, folder structures here. So if I dig in, you can start to kind of wrap your head around, okay, these are all of our different APIs that we offer um, and uh, the um, Swagger, the open API files inside, as well as the more narrative pages and, and MDX files. So um, yeah, so we landed on MDX as our sort of solution for how we wanted to empower the teams to create content. So MDX is a sort of flavor of Markdown, which enables folks to use uh, JSX or essentially React components um, inside of their um, markdown files. So this is great because it gives them the ability to have some more interactive, more sort of lively um, components to use. And um, it's also a very kind of simple syntax to understand so folks can get up to speed on it pretty quickly. Um, so yeah, so we took it even though those up further because we don't want to necessarily sit, stand in the way of them actually getting the content on the portal. Um, so we built a handy little MBX previewer. So I'll go ahead and show you a little bit about that. Uh, I have right here a sample MDX file, which I'll just get the sort of raw version of and paste it in. And you can see right straight away, uh, this is basically what it will look like on the portal. You don't have all obviously all the navigation and, and some of the menus, but this is a quick and easy way that product owners can, um, you know, just drop in um, some MDX, see how it looks, you see the icons, we have these little tiles that can link to different pages. So um, even, even here at the bottom, some additional sort of call to actions, uh, calls to action. So um, yeah, and it's all real time. If you wanted to change something or, or we had a typo, I always make edits in real time and, and see that um, as it would appear on the portal. If I go to the portal itself, you can see here it is again with all of our fancy navigation on the side. But um, again, this is an easy way for folks to kind of get up to uh, up to speed on, on how the content's going to look and, and really reduce friction. Um, so we also wanted to think about, okay, that's great for the MDX files and it's really empowering and reduces friction. That's fantastic. but. What can we do for the spec files? You know, the, the, the spec files still were a bit of a cumbersome um, area where folks had to submit a PR, had to go through a process, get onto dev, and then sometimes you would see things were missing or there were errors. So uh, what could we do to sort of give them this, this very similar experience? So obviously we wanted to take a very similar approach. So we built an API previewer, previewer or spec previewer. previewer. So um, I have some uh, just JSON here and open API spec. If I drop that in here, Again, we can see basically what this spec would look like on the portal. 
Um, you can see everything. You can show everything sort of accordion. It's essentially the same components and look and feel as what you'd see on the portal. So if I go to the actual uh, API page here, again, we don't have the download open API button in the nav, but this gives folks um, really the, the, the bulk of, of uh, the fields and the functionality of, of what it's going to look like on the portal. Um, so yeah, again, this was a way to kind of streamline and empower teams to be a little more self-sufficient. We didn't want to stand in the way um, of, of needing to get them uh, their content on the portal, um, but giving them the tools that they can be sort of self-sufficient. So along these lines, one of the things we did to make this even easier for teams is um, lots of them are generating open API specs as part of the CI pipeline. So we thought, why don't we just create a GitHub action that they can use to automatically um, basically give us that file, hand that file over to us via, via PR. Um, and that'll reduce the need for them to, have to go to our portal repo, open a PR, add comments, and do whatever they need to do. Um, so that, that'll just basically stream on the PR process. Um, and I don't know if we have an example in here, but basically, you know, we, we have a, um, a way to, for, for folks to, to integrate that into their CI pipeline. So we can just get that file from them. Um, and then um, the second part of that is, is our linting process. So we basically, we wanted to have a really strong opinion about governance and standards and uh, wanted to go to sort of above and beyond what just the open API validator gives us. So we built our own linting um, functionality, which you can actually see in our, excuse me, in our um, in our PRs. So what's actually happening here is a PR gets opened, it looks at all the files that are in that PR, spec files, um, specifically the, the JSON files and say, hey, um, we've got some 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 um, fields missing here or things don't conform to the right format or the title's not in the right sort of format. So. Um, we're working to make this a little bit better and sort of give folks better suggestions in terms of how to fix them. But this is sort of a step in the right direction in terms of giving folks the, the again, the, the sort of tools and resources to sort of be self-sufficient and, um, you know, be able to manage the content and the whole process on their own, ultimately leading to a better product, a product that's more suited to our, to our business users and, and users in general. Um, and yeah, ultimately a, a better experience for New Day and a better reflection of our capabilities and, 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 and features as a whole. So that's that's it for me. I will stop sharing and hand it back over to Megan. Thank you. Sorry, I'll be on two screens now. Um, lovely. So if we go back to here, um, we'll also quickly show our internal portal. So we have both an internal and an external portal for our um, well, internals for our internal developers. And here we've just structured our domains and we have our APIs here. But the other thing that we've actually added, what Justin shared, was we've made it really easy for people to get the support they need when uploading to our developer portal. So we have our onboarding guide, which is a step-by-step -step, um, guide to take teams through what they need to do to get their APIs on the portal. So how do they prepare for upload? What are the minimum standards that are required? And also, what are the rules around updating and deprecating their APIs? And this is really helping teams with this new process, they know that they can just come to the internal portal and find what they need in terms of the guides, the um, and in terms of the yeah the MDX previewer and the various guides. And the other thing we do um, let people know about in our tools and guides section, if I go back here, is we um, we actually do hold a drop in as well. So if, this is a new thing that we've been doing probably the past three months. But to really get people going with content um, and trying to improve the attitude towards content, we've been holding weekly drop-ins where we've seen um, a big change in attitude with content. So people are coming and they're asking questions about how can they improve their content? Are there better ways they're able to explain things? What are the expectations? And even if we've got anything, we'd recommend that to like, help them with that. Um, and then what's great to see following that is teams then going to the, our show and tell, going to show and tells that we have within the company, and they're sharing the updates they've made in the portal, saying that these are our new content pages. This is an update to our API. They'll start with their show and tell in the portal, and then go on to show like what the API does, maybe in Postman or something. So it's been great to see that change in attitude, um, especially since the start of the year. It's almost been a complete 180 in the amount of um, effort and time people are putting into the content on the portal, which in turn is really helping um, improve our portal and mature our portal. So the next thing I'll quickly um, go on to is our feedback loop. 
So we're quite fortunate in our internal and external portals are quite similar, are same in terms of their functionality, even though they're laid out slightly differently. Um, so we've been really utilizing that in terms of getting feedback with our internal users. So we've been doing this in multiple ways. The first is probably through show and tell. So whenever we have prototypes, um, new design prototypes, new features, or even new content, we've been taking them to show and tells um, for our developers and just saying, you know, like, what do you think? Like, is there anything you don't like? Is there something you do like? And then trying to create that open door policy with them to say like, even if you're having a terrible time with the portal, like, please let us know because you're the users who will probably be the most honest with us straight away first hand and we can get the information from you straight away. We can call you and talk to you a bit more to understand your, um, your feedback. And also with our drop-ins, so the weekly drop-ins we've had, when people do come, it's also a good opportunity to find out how their experience has been with the portal. A lot of our teams are consuming our internal APIs, so they often have to use the internal portal, so they are using it daily. And if there's something that they think could be better, then we're more than happy to like take that on board because it will also affect our external partners as well. And we want to find out as much as possible to improve both our internal developer experience and our external uh, external developer experience. Um, so on that note, thank you very much for listening. And we've also put a little QR code at the left if anyone wants to go through the portal and does have any feedback, um, it would be really appreciated. Um, are there any questions? Thank you for the presentation and for the, the demos. Um, they are somewhat related to two questions. Um, tell us more about how you built the custom linting on top of the Git flows. What are you using to define the rules? And in terms of developer process, what happens if the submitted open API specs don't conform? Yeah, good questions. The, the linting itself is a pretty straightforward just script. Um, it'll just look through um, the, the values in the spec and it knows what to look for. It knows like for a title, it should match a certain pattern um, if there's uh, inside the spec itself, if there are missing op operation IDs or certain specific values, um, it knows to flag those. So some of them are coming from the open API um, validator itself, and some of them are our own, our own custom rules that we're just either servicing the built-in ones or, or sort of building our own um, rules on top of that. Um, yeah, and then if things will conform, we, we have a couple different levels. Some, some actually block the PR from being merged and the spec from being merged, because again, these are like, kind of required fields that it's not, either not going to look good or it'll just break the page. I um, mean, then some, some are just more warnings. So, you know, for us, I think standardization and, and this kind of thing is a sort of a continuous process. So we're starting with, let's, let's at least flag these things to the teams and say, hey, uh, these are things that we'll want to be adding in the future. So start thinking about, you know, these missing fields. And eventually we'll probably start to sort of tighten that a little bit and make more and more of those fields actually block um, the merge. Um, but for now, it's just a matter of sort of giving reporting and giving some feedback to the to the POs and to the, the tech leads and, and engineers, like, hey, your spec's kind of not great in these areas, um, so we should make it better. So again, we have the sort of capability to kind of pull those levers depending on how strict we want to be with them. Uh, the QR code is back up. Yeah, it's gone again. Um, are you planning on growing the team? What is, is there a missing skill set for the, the new directions that you're going to be taking? Um, I think in terms of missing skill set, we're continuously training ourselves. So last year, we really suffered from, uh, you know, we were trying to hire for a technical author. So that was one of the skill sets that was missing. Uh, but we somehow gotten ourselves trained and our PO API product owners trained to write better documentation. But I think there's a massive room for improvement there as well. Um, currently, we're actively hiring for a senior engineer to join the team. Um, you know, from, from a lens of bringing in their expertise on how to connect a custom build developer portal with the API backend, which is an Azure uh, management tool that we use internally here. Um, so yeah, if, if you're looking for something more interesting in terms of a project, please reach out to one of us. <laughs> That's not what I was calling for. What I wanted to know is um, when you're adding a whole new uh, business uh what does that mean for the portal team? How much do you have to scale uh, with the growing scope of the, the business itself? This is what I was wondering about. Um, do you mean when we are integrating with a new partner? Is that? 
Um, you were explaining that you were going to add it. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I might have not understood the question. Um, never to... mind. Mm. While you were um, building out your own new portal, and uh, changing certain aspects and uh, and iterating on the information architecture. Do you recall um, some hard conflict, not among people, but among approaches that you're particularly proud of to have overcome in, sometimes there's a saying, two problems, uh, sometimes mute each other with one solution. Do you recall something like this? Yes. Um, so I think the first issue that we faced, because we're a small sized company and we were doing this almost from, from scratch, the first one was people's understanding of a developer portal. A lot of people thought it's just a bundle of API specs one after the other. Uh, and there's a whole lot more to a developer portal. So in terms of defining the information architecture, there's you know almost two different personas that you're addressing. There's a business or a product persona, and then there's you know the technologists uh, who are wanting to dive into how to integrate uh, with these specs. Um, and then the second part was how do we lay out an uh, information architecture? We could straight, uh, you know, take you into a browse API section, just find your API and, and you know, self-serve. Um, but we, while we have that feature, I think we've consciously taken a decision to solve and guide you through that process of how do you find, um, you know, your API or the solution that you're looking for. So if we go back on the home page of our developer portal, we have a section where we have identify ourselves, you know, you're a retailer or an open banking customer or, or an aggregator. Uh, that was one way of defining our information architecture. And then we also have popular products that people are connecting to. So if you know what you want to connect to, you can dive straight from there. Uh, so we've really tried to align our information architecture from a lens where somebody new is coming onto the portal, you know, making it customer centric first, rather than how we are structured internally. Mm -hmm. You mentioned in the beginning of the presentation that one of the issues that you were dealing with was the high cost of onboarding support. Um, what are you measuring on the portal that sort of proves that you are resolving that original problem? Um, so before we have the portal, uh, I think the first key thing that we've seen is our developers from our API teams are not spending time on, um, you know, calls explaining their API product to other teams internally or even external partners. So that in terms of human hours that we've saved mm -hmm. has been a key metric. Um, the second one is, you know, the, the traffic, we, we're definitely tracking all sorts of traffic that's coming onto the portal through Google analytics, which is, we've got a high percentage of repeat customers coming onto the portal, uh, which is, you know, constantly saying that, yes, we're adding value. Um, and then I think the third thing is, um, the time to onboard our customers, like you said, was the challenge. So we've, I think there's a long way to get to, uh, a stage where we are completely self-served uh, for our partner in terms of onboarding. So we've taken away the element of exploring documentation, which is all on the portal now. Uh, but the next steps here are um, a developer from a partner organization should be able to log in, should be able to request API keys um, and, you know, just get on with their API integration without even speaking to anybody uh, from New Day, you know, specifically if they don't have to. Um, so those are the key things that we're tracking right now. Mm -hmm. And bringing back the same question uh, that was also asked from uh, from Garrett from Nexio, if you can, what is um, what is your um, heuristics on what to prioritize when there's you know we want to do this this this, but which one do we do first? Um, I'm gonna leave the prioritization question from Megan because she deals with it a lot more on a daily basis than me. I think in terms of the prioritization, we often look at also like where we are. I think in terms, we're quite like new in terms of the developer portal. We only launched about a year ago. So when we're prioritizing, it's what will bring the most value to us instantly and also strategically. So there's some like, there's quite a few like some like tactical things that done by APIs that we could build for, but it doesn't make sense strategically to do that. So when we're prioritizing, it's when like when do we think things are needed? So a good example is like search functionality. With us not having much content previously, it wouldn't have been great 
implement search because they're just about four things on the portal. So you could just see it on one screen. Whereas now we're actually building out our external and internal portal much more. That has jumped up in the priority list because there's a you can see a clear need for it and the need is growing as well. Um, so I think it's that continuous effort and also aligning with our API teams and how where they're at. So we can only do as much as like the API maturity as well. So we're continuously aligning with that in terms of as much as we might like to do something now, we might not be ready from an API standpoint. So we need to just make sure we're ready when they're ready. And we use that to help prioritize as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I asked Justin in the break, is there a question you really want to be asked? Um, is there a question that nobody ever asks you uh, although you think that it's an important aspect for a team that is managing the portal. Is there a metric that is not fashionable, but actually it should be followed? Um, that's a good question. Yeah, I don't know. We There's lots of traditional metrics, right, in terms of just users and who's using the portal. But I think for us, if we think about, you know, the value of the portal, um, and like going along with what I was speaking about in terms of getting the content on, you know, what, it'd be interesting if we could look at, I'm sure we could probably get this from the PRs and, and things like what's the sort of average time to, uh, you know, basically from PR to, to going live. Um, so what's the average time to sort of like showing the value of, of our, of our functionality, whether it's a, a major update to a content page or a, a new spec file uploaded or update to spec file uploaded, that'd be an interesting metric to look at, uh, you know, just maybe more anecdotally too, but um, yeah, that's another one thing I could think of. I think there's two others probably that I can add um, to, to Justin's answer. So the first one is, I think you might have seen on um, e-commerce sites or you know apps, there's, there's something uh, which is net promoter score, NPS score that we often track. Um, I mean, mostly in developer portals, we often don't see it, but hey, it's it's the same as an e-commerce site in some sense. You know, you you come to shop for APIs and you integrate and you self serve. Um, so the ESOS in some sense is very same. So NPS score is definitely that that you know we don't track as an industry and we should be. Um, and the other one is is a long winded answer. So I think we often track when you're when you're looking at the API platform, we often track errors that an API is getting. But we don't get to the next level in terms of how, why are we getting so many errors and is there documentation which can be improved on the back of those errors. Sometimes, you know, you've got error descriptions, but they're not the most um, informative or you've not provided information on how to resolve for those errors, uh, which then ties into the developer experience lens. But, you know, sometimes they're often just tried as APIs got these many errors and we don't even think it twice of linking it better with our API documentation in DevPortal. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you very, very much for the presentation uh, and for the three of you to show the three uh, perspectives, which I find uh, very, very, very valuable because it gives a, a, a better picture. Because uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the expression, the, the hyper object, it comes from this complexity sciences when you're interacting with something that you cannot fully, you know you cannot fully hold in your mind, but every person who's interacting with it knows a slice of it and you have to put it together because there's not a single person who knows all of it at the same time perfectly. And it's really great to have the three of you talking about this same thing from your from your own side. So thank you very much for that. And I wish you a lot of success with the uh, current and upcoming works with the portal. Thank you, Laura. Thank you very much.